Okay, I've got some work done on this Hewlett Packard 400D AC vacuum tube voltmeter. Uh, I've cleaned it up a bit more. I'm kind of cleaning it up as I go along. Um, you can see it's, it's looking pretty nice. I peeled off the 1971, I think it was, calibration sticker. Um, and under it, it was it revealed this hard um, adhesive, which I think will be able to be chipped off very gently uh, with some persistence. So I will continue to work on that. But but it's uh, it's cleaning up rather nicely. And I just wanted to catch us up because it's been a few weeks on the progress that I've been making. I've been very busy, distracted with other things, and also had to wait for some parts to arrive. So this isn't going as quickly as I had hoped. But in the process, I'm gaining quite an appreciation for this unit and the design. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Well, you can see these bright yellow capacitors that I've changed. You'll recall that these were tiny chief sealed paper capacitors. And many of them had held up quite nicely in terms of leakage, uh, but others leaked pretty badly. Uh, so I just decided to change those all out. Uh, so I you know, went through and figured the foil size of all of these and replaced them. I have also continued my spot checking of resistors and have only found um, maybe one that actually had drifted quite a bit. And so that one was replaced as well. And you can see that right here. I've tried to maintain the topology of the wiring as closely as possible to the originals. And I'll get into why I'm trying to do that in a moment. Um, I've replaced one CAN resistor, I'm sorry, capacitor, that was there. Um, right now these are just kind of hanging in the breeze. I will find a way to secure those in a, in a better way later. But they're <clears throat> good enough for now. They're not, they're not going anywhere. There's uh, a few things I want to point out here. Um, when I replaced this, I had seen other videos by people that uh, I admire on YouTube that had shown with deceptive simplicity <laughs> how easy it is to, or maybe I should say how to, I just assumed that it would be easy because they made it look easy because they actually had done it before. They, uh, they made it look straightforward to restuff the old capacitor cans. And Suffice it to say that on my first attempt, <clears throat> it was not a successful experience. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in addition to the much of the house smelling like tar that I had uh, created the smell of when I heated the can up, I ended up mangling the can to even get it to that point and it just didn't work. Um, so perhaps I'll try that again, but We'll, we'll see how that goes. I'll, I'll come up with some solution. So that's the story with, the, uh, with that set of electrolytics. These are the 1500 microfarad electrolytics that act as, uh, act as filter capacitors on the 6.3 volt DC filament circuit. And you say, well, what? <laughs> Why would you drive 
filaments with DC? And there's, there's an answer for that, and we'll get to it in just a moment. <clears throat> but before I get to that, I want to call your attention to this object right here. Um, this is vintage, I think, 1959. If you can see, let me zoom in a bit here. If you can see that without the glare. That looks like it says inspected A59, which I take to mean that it rolled off the inspection line, um, maybe Inspector A, sometime in 1959. And that would be about right from the documentation I've seen online for, for this meter. Um, I figured that, well, this thing here is uh, probably an, Ill an early silicon rectifier, full wave bridge rectifier. And it's this object right here in the schematic. And, uh, you know, that shows diodes pretty obviously, right, for the, uh, for the modern eye. And, you know, there's, what else would it be? Yes, this looks like plates from a, a, a selenium rectifier, but in my experience with selenium, which is admittedly uh, limited, um, selenium rectifiers are much longer. They consist of many more stacks, typically six or seven, sometimes more. And, um, you know, there's only, what, four plates on this. So I kind of, in passing, figured, you know, thought that these were very early silicon diodes. They, the plates were actually heat sinks, and I didn't think any much, much, you know, very much more about it. But one of the viewers left a comment about the selenium. And uh, I thought, well... I, it could be selenium, I, d I don't think it is, but there's probably an answer to be had here. And um, that answer probably has to do with the forward voltage drop of this. So <laughs> I removed this. Uh, this is removed by just undoing this uh, nut here. And then it drops right out. I unsoldered uh, all four of the connections um, and there was a little bit of adventure there but I won't go into that um, and on the back uh, not on the front but on the underside it says um, I think it's International Rectifier Corporation I think that's what the uh, what the stamp was and this is a company that still exists today um, in the same place El Segundo California of course, there is nothing on the internet that, um, in terms of catalogs or anything that <clears throat> I could find that uh, had the part number that's also stamped on the backside. But I just naively went about measuring forward voltage drops, and I got things that didn't make a lot of sense when I tried to compare them to silicon or germanium, um, and it led me down a rather interesting pathway to reading about selenium. So I believe that this is selenium, as the one viewer kindly pointed out. And uh, selenium, I believe, was first used in maybe the 1930s, possibly earlier, as uh, <clears throat> in rectifiers. Selenium rectifiers come in stacks of different plates, and each plate is a junction of a piece of selenium uh, and a metal, uh, typically steel or aluminum. They're characterized by a forward voltage drop of typically one to two volts. Um, with you know, it will vary, but as a rule of thumb, and they have a uh, reverse voltage drop. That is, that is quite finite, uh, unlike silicon or germanium diodes, which you know, will, con <clears throat> will conduct in one and only one direction. Apparently the seleniums um, had, a, uh, had much leakier uh, current in the reverse direction. 
So the forward voltage drop, as I said, is typically one to two volts. And um, each selenium stack, so each junction, had a peak inverse voltage, uh, what we would term today peak inverse voltage, of between 15 and 30 volts. So this explains immediately why in my previous experience with selenium rectifiers, there were six or seven stacks. Um, and you say, well, why, why does that explain that immediately? And the answer is, is that um, if you're using this as a, uh, you know, a single wave rectifier, maybe I should say a quarter wave rectifier, 120 volts RMS is the same thing as 170 volts peak voltage. And so if you divide 170 volts uh, by 30 volts per plate, then you get about six plates necessary to uh, deal with line voltage. And as I said, I've seen selenium rectifiers that have many more than six or seven plates, and that probably has to do with uh, configurations that had a smaller than 30 volt peak inverse voltage. So that's that. Why am I concerned about this? Well, uh, selenium, if you look at uh, different forums and read different literature, tends to evoke strong opinions in people. And the reason is the following. As selenium junctions age, selenium rectifiers age, the forward voltage drop will often increase. Uh, at the same time, the current leakage in the reverse direction will also increase. Now, if you think about that for a moment, the more current that flows in the reverse direction, the more work that that current is able to do uh, on that junction, and the hotter the junctions will become. And typically, the hotter the junctions become, the worse the problem gets with leakage voltage and forward voltage drop. And so it becomes uh, a problem that can very rapidly burn this up and impact uh, electrically uh, nearby parts of the circuit, like, uh, for example, <laughs> the transformer. So this is bad ele electrically, electronically, but it's also bad biologically. Uh, this apparently, when selenium rectifiers uh, oxidize, burn up, uh, it produces a smell that is extraordinarily pungent. Uh, and at the best, uh, unpleasant because of that, and at the worst, uh, hazardous, in that um, the uh, byproducts can, uh, I'm told, uh, burn mucous membranes and, and things like that. And, it just seems like something that I don't want to deal with uh, the possibility of this burning up. So I, as I said, I, I tried to measure the forward voltage. I did it under a little bit for voltage drop. I did it under somewhat of a load, by which I mean I uh, allowed my current limiting power supply to provide a goodly amount of current, uh, several tens of milliamps, and uh, through a uh, uh, at least a one kilo ohm load, which is probably not exactly the operating conditions, but but uh, you know much more realistic than just a diode checker on a on a DMM. And I found a forward voltage that seemed to be acceptable, um, and you know it wasn't heating up or anything like that. So I decided to reinsert this back in the circuit. I didn't do these tests, you know, in the circuit. Um, I did them with, with DC power supply. I decided to put this back in the circuit and uh, do the troubleshooting and restoration of this with this in there. And then if I'm able to, you know, just to, to eliminate one degree of freedom, uh, and if I'm able to get this in somewhat of a, a, a nicely calibrated functional state, then I will address this. Uh, part of the circuit. Okay, so let me try to cut to the chase here. So this is the part of the circuit. Make this a bit bigger. 
All right, so this is the part of the circuit right here, that's Selenium stack. And notice that uh, it hangs off of a 6.3 uh, volts RMS uh, winding on the secondary and a 7.3, so that those sum to 13.6 volts. Now, um, if you drop a volt through the rectification process, then that gives you 12.6 volts DC over here. Uh, and you can tune that up a little bit with this uh, uh, adjustable pot right there. And, and that's that. So that will provide 12.6 volts into these you know, gargantuan uh, uh, filter capacitors. It's 1500 microfarad. And it will drive then two sets of uh, six volt filaments uh, one set in parallel, V1 and V2, and the other set in parallel, V3 and V4, so that when you sum these, you drop 12.6 volts. Okay, so um, so we're driving four volts, uh, I'm sorry, four tubes with uh, DC, and the rest we're driving with AC. So we're driving uh, tubes V1, V2, V3, and V4 with DC, and we're letting the others be supplied with this winding here or this winding up here. So let's just look at this circuit um, from a, a broader perspective. <clears throat> so what do we have? Well, over here, don't want to make you seasick, but zoom in a little bit more. So we have our input over here. And the input uh, comes into a voltage, uh, an RC voltage divider. This is a 10.3 mega ohm resistor there, and then you've got some you know, tens of Ks and hundreds over here. So, you know, this this input impedance is is not small, but um, but it's not astronomically large either. So we have this voltage divider and the switch for the different ranges, and uh, the, the the signal will then go in to uh, this grid on V1, uh, and over here we have. Uh, a voltage, uh, I'm sorry, an attenuator circuit, a bunch of step attenuators. So this this circuit right here surrounding V1 is actually a buffer that uh, uh, joins this high impedance side of the circuit to lower impedance circuits over here, which are uh, broadband amplifiers. So this is a cathode follower. Notice the signal comes off the cathode through a series of resistors and capacitors. So this is the, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, this is the RC attenu uh, attenuator circuit. Uh, and that is then fed into this branch. Sorry for bumping the camera there. This branch uh, of V2, V3, V4, and V5. So these constitute a very broad band amplifier. Um, and so, you know, off this cathode, we go into this tube, into the grid of that, take, take the output off the plate, feed it into the grid of this tube, take the output off the plate, feed it into that one, and then so on up to V5. Now remember that V1, V2, V3, and V4 are fed with DC, uh, the filaments are fed with, with DC. And the reason for that is, is that depending on the range, you could be dealing with some very, very small uh, signals in the amplifying branch. And, and by feeding those filaments with DC, I think the idea was that you <clears throat> will introduce, uh, you won't introduce 60 cycle or 120 cycle, whatever, uh, noise, uh, 60 cycle noise, obviously, in, into, into this process. So um, that, that's clever. By the time you reach V5, um, you know this is the last step in the amplification. Um, that noise is is no longer relevant, and so uh, V5 and above are driven with a AC uh, filaments. So again, input voltage divider, uh, buffer, attenuator into this broadband amplifier, and then into the meter part of the circuit. So, um, so rather clever circuit uh, for driving that meter, which I won't go into. Uh, 
rectified comes down the bottom of that uh, meter bridge circuit and is fed back in to V2. So uh, we don't want this to oscillate. This will be a negative feedback loop. And <clears throat> uh, the loop gain, which has to be less than one, is uh, governed by this RC circuit right here. So there's an adjustable, uh, you know, a variable resistor there and a variable capacitor and, and some other resistors. Notice this resistor is listed as 71.16 ohms right there. That should give you pause. <laughs> um, it's not the only, let me zoom in just a bit more again. So this is not the only precision resistance that is listed in this circuit. Look at these resistors over here on the uh, attenuation. You've got this one which is uh, specified down to a tenth of an ohm. This is specified down to a tenth of an ohm and so on and so forth. I will show you where I believe those are uh, physically in, in this instrument in just a moment. But suffice it to say that this is um, complicated enough with this negative feedback circuit uh, and the uh, attenuation block that this is a much more complicated thing to restore and calibrate than I appreciated before I looked closely at the circuit. Um, so I ask a, a question about, I don't even remember what it was about at this point, but, but something about this meter on one of the internet forums and uh, got very helpful responses, but <laughs> one of the responses uh, cautioned me to do as little as humanly possible in this because the wiring was you know, set up uh, with great care at the factory and essentially you know, mess with that at your own peril. And I didn't fully appreciate it at the time until I really started digging into the circuit and the advice is exactly right. So I'm trying to stay as close, you know, with the wiring layout and, and everything as possible to the uh, original. Uh, that does not, however, deter me from, at some point, replacing this with silicon and dropping resistors as appropriate uh, to remove the potential, uh, however remote, of this thing literally melting down and causing a situation that uh, I don't want to deal with. All right, let me just show a couple other things. One of the capacitors that I removed was this Black Beauty capacitor. And uh, let me get something that I can point with in, in close up. <clears throat> so as I said, these are notorious for going bad. And this one has. Um, let me, okay, here it is. Let me try to do this. Okay. So right here, there's a crack. I don't know if you can see it, but it extends longitudinally across this capacitor. Um, there's a, you can see it right there through the paint and through that paint and through that paint. Um, there, I think the lighting's a little bit better. See it right there, right there. So what has happened is these, for whatever reason, uh, notoriously do that. They crack and whatever is inside of it, I think there was a, the, the paper was permeated with some sort of oil leaks out, evaporates, what have you, and it it causes these to, to change uh, value quite dramatically. And so um, if you just look at this, this should have been a, what, a, uh, uh, a 47 nanofarad capacitor, and it, you know, it's changed quite a bit. So um, there are parts of the circuit where that just is not going to be helpful at all. And that, uh, that would include, for example, the uh, capacitors in this attenuation branch. 
So those are going to be rather difficult to get to over here. So uh, let me see if I can shed a little bit more light on this. So there they are, they're down in there. <laughs> um, and you can see, maybe you can see, try to hone in on this a bit more. You can see cracks in some of those just without looking even very closely at all. Um, I think these windings here are those precision resistances in the uh, attenuator circuit. So these, you know, the resistances are just made from some sort of high resistance wire, uh, some of them, and, uh, you know, were measured at the factory. So I'm going to have to remove this whole assembly, which is quite involved. They mention in the manual that um, if you have problems with the switch, this, uh, you know, wafer switch, that the adjustments, you know, the way these, the parts are placed and so on, are uh, so critical uh, that they're set at the factory that they they don't even recommend that you try to fix, you know, a broken wafer switch or something, that you just remove the whole assembly, send it to them, and, and that they would send you a new assembly. So, um, that's a rather daunting thing to attack in a basement electronics bench uh, area. I'm nervous about you know, applying any heat around these, uh, these wires. Uh, so anyway, um, you, you, you see the point that I'm skeptical about my ability to rehabilitate this unit. Um, and yet I'm, I'm gonna keep buggering on and, and give it a shot uh, because, you know, I'll learn a lot and I might even be successful. Um, so that's where I am on this. Uh, it, you know, I, again, I'm, uh, I know it's been a while. I uh, have had a lot of other things going on and haven't had as much time to dig into this as possible, which is probably a good thing uh, because reflecting on this a bit and uh, appreciating the difficulties, I think, probably improve the likelihood that I'll be able to do something useful with it. Uh, I have to, you know, deal with these uh, these cans here. I have to figure out how to test this capacitor. Um, it's not difficult. I have to, just have to remove it from the circuit, but that's not quite as easy as falling off a log. And that's uh, that's where we are at this point. I will I will sally forth and report back in a future video on any additional interesting things that I find. And, uh, you know, there'll be at least one video, uh, at least one more on whether I've been successful or how badly unsuccessful I've been when, uh, when I get this done. This is, uh, getting long, so I will stop there. I will say that I found other things that, uh, I'm rehabilitating as well. Um, panning over here to the other part of the bench, <coughs> there's a uh, the militarized equivalent of the HP 410B. This is the what the ME 26DU. Uh, <coughs> it has taught me some things already, but you know it has the not the militarized probe, but uh, but a functional AC probe, and um, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to get this up and working as well. Uh, as I said, I've, I've learned a couple of things on it that I hadn't thought about previously, and that will probably make it into the next video. All right, I hope you found this interesting and potentially even useful. Uh, if so, please give a thumbs up below, and if you don't subscribe to the channel, please consider doing so. As always, thanks for watching.